Hello everyone. I would like to show to you uh, a game in Alakon's defense uh, between two unknown players Heinrich Wagner with the white pieces versus Ludwig Relstab Sr. with the black pieces. This game is from 1930 and it's a, a nice system to surprise uh, uh, established uh, Alakon defense player. And what I like about this system is that it's not uh, unsound. So, yes, black can equalize, but it's an offbeat system that uh, is very dangerous but if black doesn't fall into any of the uh, uh, tricks then the game is just a regular uh, equal chess position so it's definitely a nice uh, uh, opening to have in your arsenal and this applies specifically to uh, the modern variation of the Alakine when black plays g6 and tries to initiate a fianchetto also known as the Albert variation so let's get into it enjoy so e4 knight f6 this is uh, the start of Alakine's defense and the idea is basically to attack white center right away with the pieces and um, provoke white into overextending himself and that he will try to prove that white's uh, presence in the center is premature and thus weak. However, practice has shown that as long as white does not overextend himself, say putting too many pawns in the center, that uh, he maintains uh, an advantage in the position. So, the most critical move is definitely e5, attacking the knight. There are many other moves here. Knight c3, but this plays into black's hands. Black immediately can equalize with e5. And we have a Vienna game. If black wants to play in true Alakon fashion, a lot of Alakon players will play d5. And then after... Uh, just note that this move is, is uh, can be played but after e takes d5 the game transposes into a Scandinavian so there's another transposition this is also playable with several different lines bishop d2 and there's all kind of stuff here again black is, is fine All, type, all types of funny stuff this can be played again black is fine probably shouldn't take this pawn he can uh, come under uh, some type of attack here but decent is good decent and good is that so the critical move here some players play this of course leads to equality the critical move has always been uh, e5 attacking the knight knight d5 d4 d6 notice how black immediately strikes back at the center because black has to get to work as soon as possible because the idea is that black understands that this can be an advantage and that will be an advantage if white has time to support his center adequately getting his pieces uh, his knight and his bishops out to support the center then this will become an advantage as these pawns take away critical squares in black's position and make it difficult for him to develop that's why occupation of the center is very important. Control of the center is important also. The occupation of the center is, is um, very important also. So what we have here is black's idea is to control the center. And white is trying to occupy the center. And then eventually control it. So control and occupation is uh, leads to an advantage. 
So black is trying to tear down that center before it gets to that. Before white can really solidify it. So there's d6. Knight f3. You see white's just simply protecting his investment. g6. This is like the uh, known as the Albert variation after Grandmaster Lev Albert who was probably the greatest uh, at least in modern times the greatest champion and player of the Alakine's defense there are many others that of course uh, have devoted their chess careers to playing this defense uh, like Alexander Shabalov as many games of uh, Vladimir uh, Bajirov as many games but Lev Albert as far as uh, I know is the, is, is the uh, basically the man in this variation has played it at uh, the highest levels for many years um, and he, su he suffered some brutal losses he have some some fine wins but he definitely uh, suffered some brutal losses uh, for anyone looking for a reference is def look at um, the match between Nigel Short and uh, Lev Albert I think that was in 1985 or something look at that match because uh, practically every game that uh, Lev Albert was black he played Alakine's defense you know just faithfully and and he he pretty much got hammered in that by Nigel Sword. Nigel Sword's a, a was E4 player at the time very very classically motivated player and uh, I mean I give credit to Lev Albert for sticking to his guns but uh, that that was a uh, that didn't make the Alakine look too enticing okay so this idea right here with g6 of course there's different moves that can be played here for instance the pawn capture and that is played sometimes this variation is falling under um, a cloud c6 is also played here the main idea of c6 being if c4 knight b4 the idea is after say a3 then queen takes d4 and then if queen takes d4 then you have this check and you uh, you know force the king to move and then you capture and black is equalized that's the idea behind that the c6 move so there's that variation um, black also plays this there's several different lines here but this is the Albert variation the idea is to fiend kettle this bishop here and again put additional pressure on the pawn and notice how these different moves fight for the center whether it's putting the bishop here adding increased pressure down on these pawns on the diagonal or playing bishop g4 which which holds the uh, influence of this knight temporarily and again puts pressure indirectly on these squares so black is fighting for the center and then the other move he just takes and again fighting for the center and this has shown not to be too good after bishop g4 this pawn comes under intense uh, scrutiny you know for instance uh, let's do some moves here c3 and e6 <clears throat> Actually, I think that move was wrong. Knight c7. Um, yeah, for instance, uh, sorry about that. Queen takes. I'm trying to show you an idea here. Queen takes f3, right, and e6, right. And now let's say c4. And the idea is, and what usually happens, in many lines is this pawn comes under pressure. So, for instance, here, here, right, and let's say, uh, you know, bishop f4, 
C6, say work here, and more pressure. And you can see these pieces all ganging up on the E-pawn. Of course, I made some, you know, shady moves, but I just wanted to illustrate what happens and the reason why white often doesn't take with the pawn in that variation because of, cause of what happens there. So usually after D takes, knight takes, and then black plays for moves like C5 and, and are still attacking, trying to destroy the, uh, the uh, pawn structure and influence of white in the position. All right, so back to the game. So G6, and here, here, and you might say, well, what's different about this game and any other game? Here's the here's the move that Wagner played. Knight G5. Now that looks like a move, uh, like a real amateur move, and and uh, somebody that plays Alakon's defense does not see this too often. This is not something that somebody real experienced would play and it might throw some players off guard because what what's your initial reaction when you see this move the initial reaction is to play the move h6 just to kick the knight out of there and that's what happened in this game sorry about that switch this switch the board up on you guys Make sure you're paying attention. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so after h6, right? This is what happened in the game. h6. Can you guess the move that Wagner played here? Yep. Knight takes f7. Attacking the queen and the rook. So this piece has to be taken. King takes f7. Queen F3 check. Now, Knight F6 was played. Because he's definitely not going to bring the king out into E6. E takes F6. E takes F6. And it looks like black is okay here. You figure black is just giving back the piece in a timely manner. The pawn structure is uh, pretty much symmetrical. White has a little bit more space, so he's okay. But the main difference is this: the king safety. And white to move. White has the initiative. Bishop c4. Now. I want to go back to show you an alternative. Instead of h6, the proper move to play is just continue with your plan of attacking the center here. D takes e5, d, d takes e5, d takes e5, and bishop g7. You see? Get that tempo right there. But, bishop c4, double attack on the knight c6 and then just castle and black can capture this pawn but white definitely has compensation uh, for this pawn so if you're an attacking player this might be this is a type of uh, type of chess that you can uh, subscribe to you definitely have compensation you can you can uh, do your own research uh, use your engines and stuff like that but white definitely has compensation he's active he has some attacking prospects on the king side in this position but what will happen many times and I play this play this in blitz a lot is many opponents will react with h6 and h6 is not necessarily wrong as you can see the ensuing position but what's great about it is that you get an attacking position 
this is a good position right here. D5 is not possible at this moment. Because queen and bishop are controlling that square. Bishop E6 not really working too good because the queen will be able to capture here and harass this rook. So, again, defensive play for black. And notice black is not able to develop his pieces because he's on the run. So, yes, black has given up the piece. Material is uh, even, but who has the better prospects here in the position? White. White has a lead in development, more space. And it's White's move right now. Look at these pieces. Bishop is bad here. The king is in an awkward position. And Black is just way behind in development. So this is a good uh, starting position for for uh, White. I would love to have this position. Okay, so after uh, the king gets out the way, King G7... What does white do next? There's no spectacular explosive uh, uh, move here. He just castled. He just keeps developing. He has a better position. He just keeps it moving. I want to take it back to uh, to bishop c4 check because I forgot to show you another alternative that might even be stronger. I'm not sure it might be in the eye of the beholder but instead of bishop c4 knight c3 the idea getting the knight involved and now excuse me now c6 taking that square away and preparing to play uh, d5 just blocking everything keeping the position closed bishop d3 d5 Right. Notice how Black's trying to keep the position closed, and that's how you should play when you're under attack, and especially behind the development. Bishop f4, and look at White's development. Queen e7, and King d2. The idea of bringing the rooks, the rooks onto the e file, and this is another fantastic uh, position for Black. Excuse me for white. The the position practically plays itself. But back to the main line, Bishop C4 was played. Check. And after King G7, Castle, and C6, and Black has the same idea. He just wants to close things down. Being behind in development, you do not want to open position. So Black is just trying to close everything. The problem is, is that. He's making these pawn moves and king moves, but none of the pieces uh, have come off the back rank except the king. So he's trying to close things down, but it's very, uh, he's in a very precarious situation here. Knight c3. Natural moves. And what I like about this game is white's moves are real easy to come up with. I mean, after knight takes f7, right? Everything else has been pretty easy. The queen f3 check. Bishop c4 is natural. Castle. Knight c3. Um, white has like really what you call like a beginner's position. Bishop on c4. Knight on c3. The other bishop goes, to, you know, can go to f4. The rooks come into the central files. It's real easy to play. And white has this simple position. Right, and it's playing this simple chess, but look how shaky Black's position looks. And this is one of the reasons why I love this game so much. It's because White is playing real simple looking moves, but Black is in the whole world of trouble. So D5, closing up shop. And, of course, threatening to win the bishop here. So, that diagnose closed. And remember, if you look at my other videos, I'll tell you there's three ways. 
sometimes four, but mainly three three ways to play against a bishop. And now, in uh, other videos, I'm speaking in um, reference to Fianchetto bishops, when a bishop is on g2, g7, or uh, b7, and b2. But it applies to bishops in general also. What are the three ways to play against a bishop? One is you block it, as you see in this position. You block the action of the bishop. The bishop can't um, do anything further on this diagonal because of the d5 pawn. That's one way. The second way to play against the bishop is to trade it off with your bishop. In other words, if there's a powerful, if the, your opponent has a powerful bishop, then you would like to just, and you and your bishop can't, it's worse, you would like to trade it off. So for instance, if black could w w wave a magic wand, he would love to take this bishop on c8 and trade it off for this bishop. But he can't do that in this position. So that's the second way. Of course, going along with the uh, the blockade, the blockading theme is the uh, sometimes you can provoke the opponent into blocking his own bishop, right? But that still falls under uh, blocking. So you have blocking, um, you have uh, the trading, trading the bishop off, and the third way is is what I call or what is called the scorched earth policy, which basically means that you just clear out whatever diagonal that bishop is on and uh you don't have any of your pieces uh on on the uh, on the bishop's path and basically that bishop is useless because he can't attack anything he only can uh you know maybe stop pieces from potentially going over but if you don't want to uh, go over those squares then the bishop's basically useless, so it's kind of like the bishop is like just swinging that air. And if you notice, that's the policy that's used in a lot of end games. Say you have like the uh, opposite color bishop end games, and you put all your pawns on the opposite color of your opponent's bishop. So that bishop is swinging around the board, but can't capture anything. And, and a lot of times it's just drawn, because that's the scorched earth policy. In other words, he has nothing, nothing to attack. Those are three main ways. Of dealing with the bishop so here we see that uh, rel stop black decides that he's gonna block this bishop fine problem is the bishop has somewhere else to go he comes to bishop d he comes to bishop uh, d3 and gets on a different diagonal so that's the thing and that's why I don't like the um, fin kettle personally I mean, of course, there's many different openings, you know, English opening, you know, you got your King's Indian defense, King's Indian attack, many openings that you can fit in Keto. So believe me, I'm not saying, oh, it's bad to fit in Keto. I'm saying personally, I don't like to fit in Keto early in the game because it just like basically shows your hand too early in the position. Your opponent said, oh, you're putting your bishop on G2? Because some people like they'll play G3 and, and Bishop G2 or Knight F3, G3, Bishop G2 right away. And then it's kind of like if your opponent shows his hand that early, you can just play just play, play against the bishop. You know, shut the bishop out of the game. You know, that's a, it's probably oversimplistic, but there are a lot of games that, that show that that happens. But here... The bishop just developed to the center. Yes, he, he blocked the bishop off, off this one diagonal, but there's another one, and he can't block all of them. So after bishop d3, bishop d6. So finally we see black getting into the action, and he has a nice diagonal. That's great. So, again... Like I said, we have several ways of dealing with the bishops. So how is white going to deal with black's bishop now on d6? That's looking pretty. Again, he can block it, right? He can play g6, try to block the, uh, excuse me, g3 and block the action of the bishop, right? Or you can look at the pieces. Let me get rid of that arrow. You can look at the pieces. The two bishops, right? The two dark square bishops. And which one is worse? Well, obviously, it's the one on C1 is worse. This one is on a nice diagonal. This bishop is, is not is, is here. 
Spencer has some potential. But I think I would choose this one on the black bishop here. So perhaps these bishops may be equal. But I have to give black the slight nod because it's actually in play right now. And a directed at the uh, king side. And along with the queen may be able to provoke some weakness later on. Whereas this bishop's not developed yet. Although it is uh, basically it's probably on his best square actually right here. But hinders the coordination of the rooks. So white's best policy might probably be to just trade it off. Trade the bishops off. That also keeps uh, white's development lead uh, intact. So he plays the knight to uh, e2. Now, what's the idea of that? Well, if you notice, look at the knight's prospects. So, the knight has basically done his job. And now the position is clarifying, so we see that black has weakness over here in the queen side, king side. This king is exposed, and we had the bishop and the queen over here in the king side. So now the knight is going to come over to the queen side. Excuse me, I keep saying queen side to the king side. The further I did also is to trade these pieces. So, black's trying to get in, into the game. Knight d7. And again, this knight has to move again. There's really no prospects for the knight. Right? The knight's gonna... This pawn may, you know, may have to go to f6. Excuse me, f5. And then then the knight go, go uh, to f6. And then tries to jump into e4. So, the problem is, is for white to untangle... He needs time. And time isn't on... Excuse me, for black to untangle, he needs time. And time isn't really on his side. So now, the bishop is unprotected temporarily. And white decides to bring his bishop to f4. Again, now look at the move black made. So he protects the bishop, but... He moves the knight to f8, which only could serve a defensive purpose of reinforcing this pawn right here. Yes, it opens up this bishop, but again, it takes time. Maybe he wants to bring the bishop here someday or something like that, or perhaps redirect the knight here to e6, but it, uh, it, all these moves take time. Time is very important. So, with that time, white starts concentrating concentrating on uh, the king. So, now the queen and king are lined up. We see the attack on the bishop. So, this forces black's hand. You think black wanted to play that move? Of course he didn't. That's why he played knight f8. But white forced him to do it. So now we have three pieces. Excuse me. We have three pieces lined up on this square. Of g6. And now all kind of. Uh, you know threats are in the air. You know moves like knight to h5 for instance. With check. Knight takes is a threat. Bishop takes on g5, g6 is a threat. Again, look at the uh, look at the development situation. Look at the development situation here uh, of black. It's absolutely incredible. And this is after 16 moves. We're on move 16. And black has not developed anything. We're on move 16. And black has only developed this king. So after knight takes f4. 
and all of these threats. F5 is played. Again, another pawn move. So he, he wards off the threat to G6 temporarily, but kills his bishop. And again, remember I was saying that's one of the ways to play against a bishop. Blockade it. So he blockades his own bishop. And he blockades the white bishop. Okay, moving on. Again, see how elementary that move was? Rook to the open file. There's only one open file, and rooks belong in open files. So that was like a real simple move to make. And again, that's one of my favorite things about this game is the simplicity by which, the almost primitive nature by which white just dismantles uh, black here. So rook to g8. Again, that shows the uh, the suspect nature of the position. And the idea is black wants to get his king to say to some type of safety, but meanwhile I'll uh, be able to protect his pawn. Because right now, the king on g7 and the knight on um, f8 are stuck with the task of defending his pawn. So black rightfully wants to get his king away from that. And away from tactics such as knight to h5. And so he brings the rook to g8 to uh, basically take over for the king. And protecting the g6 pawn. So now what? c4. Idea is real, again, real simple. Let's just try to open up the position. Remember I said that this diagonal was blocked. And this, this diagonal is blocked also. So, white is trying to open up the position for his pieces to get at the king. Because the king is in a precarious situation. So, if he, he can open up the C file, then the other rook can participate. And also, if black were to capture on C4, for instance, he can take with his bishop with tempo on the rook. So basically, white wants to uh, rip open the position while he's ahead in development. And black would like to keep it closed if he can. So after c4, d takes c4, bishop takes c4, and he was attacking the rook here. Notice this pawn is on prees also. The queen can capture. But I don't think white cares at this point. So with this move, we see black's idea refuted. Is now the rook has to go back in, in the, into the corner. So now we see white right back on the beautiful diagonal. So you see the fight for diagonals here. First black strove to... Uh, try to kill this bishop by playing d5 and then f5 blocking blocking the action of this bishop but now white has opened the doors again for his for his piece but notice that door stays closed to the bishop on c8 ouch did you see that right was that a mistake so after rook h <laughs> It's oh man, this is a great great game. After Rook H eight. Again, this is a guy you never heard of. You never heard of Heinrich Wagner. Look how these guys look how these guys were playing in nineteen thirty. No computers, no engines, right? No chess base, none none of that. No database, two, three million games, none of that. And look at the the beautiful games and the tactical uh, alertness these guys were playing with white here looking for his chance play rook e8 attacking the queen and you looking at it right now saying what if he just takes take a few minutes and, and look and look at the ramifications here okay this is a sacrifice designed 
This is a sacrifice designed to distract the king, excuse me, the queen from the D8 square. And you got to ask yourself why. If you want, you should pause the video and try to try to look at the variation, try to figure it out. Why white deems it important to distract the queen from the D8 square cuz that's what this this move is about. So what happened after rook e8? Relstad played queen g5. So all of you people that didn't look, let me show you what happens after queen takes e8. So that was played. So after queen takes e8, so now he's off this important diagonal. Okay, that was the purpose. So after queen e takes e8, now you can see knight h5, check. Okay, remember this knight is immune to capture because of the pin. Check. Now look at all the diagonals and stuff cut off. Right? The bishop has this diagonal on lock so the king cannot go to f7 or g8. This knight is guarding, is controlling g7 and f8. Excuse me, and f6. So the king cannot go to any of those squares. Only square that's available for the king, right, is h7. Now look at the position. Now look at the queen and look at the king. Okay, now you can see it, right? The fork. Beautiful. See, now you stop there, right? You see the fork beautiful however it doesn't even stop there you keep going knight f6 so you just win the queen right knight f6 check king g7 knight takes e8 check again look at all the squares covered everything's covered king has no choice but to go back King goes back to h7. Strongest move on the board. Queen e5, threatening mate. Right? You got the knight here, queen here. Here's your focal point. Knight e6. Only move that'll stop the, the immediate mate. So now what? We can remove the defender, right? We could just play bishop g7. Excuse me, bishop takes, uh, was that e6? You know, but then rook takes. That won't be as dramatic. We're looking for a dramatic move here. Remember, I was telling you how all these squares are cut off around the king. We just play queen g7. Check. You say, wait a minute, that's not mate. Ah, you got me. Knight takes g7. But then I say, no, I got you. Knight f6, and that's a beautiful mate. Again, everything's cut off. So, going back to the position right here, this player Wagner, right? Or Wagner, how it's probably properly pronounced. When he played this move, he saw. The continuation at least up to winning the queen. I don't know if he saw it all the way to mate, but he saw at least until winning uh until winning the queen. And Relstab to his credit also saw that he would lose his queen. So he played Queen G five in order to just simply trade off. Now here, Wagner makes, hold on, my phone just rang. All right, we're back again. Sorry about that. All right, where were we? Okay, I see the queen on g5. So, after queen g5, this is where I think Wagner made his only, 
I mean, it's like he showed he's not. He showed he's human, basically. That there was no uh, supercomputers in 1930, and he played the move, a natural-looking move, Queen E3. You know, just taking over the file, and basically he's gonna cash in. He's looking at this, you know, and uh, Black played H5, and after Queen E5. He just simply resigned as uh, he's pretty much totally busted. I mean, there's no, again, all these squares are, are just taken away. He goes there with the queen. He drops the rook. If he tries to come to g7, let me, let me move these arrows. If he tries to come to uh, h7 with the king, simple move like rook e7 check and black will have to give up his queen so that was a beautiful game by white there I just want to show you what I meant by saying that uh, Wagner was human instead of playing queen e3 which is a great move of course it's just a natural move this game I mean perhaps it feels like uh, um, uh Alicon or like Tao, somebody like you know on a different level playing, they might have found the move H4, which which is just incredible, which uh, leads leads to uh, mate. And I'll show you the line right now. So for instance, after Queen takes G3, Rook E7. King F6 and Rook F7 mate, which is just awesome. That would have been that would have been just an awesome end, <laughs> an awesome way to end the game. And then the other line, of course, after H4, double exclamation mark. And again, these are my. These are my own notes. You won't find this game probably annotated anywhere. Um, and if you do see it, it won't have these notes because these are, this is my own study. But um, after H4, let's say he spots the mate and rook G8. This gives, it, gives up the queen. H takes G5. Bishop E6. Right, trying to block the action of the bishop. G takes h6 and then after king h8 this rook takes and then let's see bishop d5 knight takes g6 king h7 knight takes f8 check king takes h6 Queen h4, King g7, Queen h5, King f7, Queen takes f5, and this is gonna lead the mate also, of course, King e7. And I just wanted to show you this because White brings all the pieces in for the grand finale. And after that, block by the bishop, and just Queen e5 uh, finishes finishes it off. So, like I said, that's the star move was that H4 with the idea of just queen takes uh, G3, which is uh, just this awesome, awesome, awesome. I wish I could go back in time and make uh, make Wagner see that King F6 and Rook F7 mate. That's beautiful. <clears throat> but again. I hope you enjoyed that game thoroughly as I did. I mean, I've I've looked at this game many, 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 many times over over the years, and uh, there's just like I said, what I love about it is that it just shows that amateur players or relatively unknown players, you know, can can uh, play beautiful games of chess too, and I think that's part of the reason why we enjoy the game so much because. Everybody's not gonna be Magnus Carlsen. Everybody's not Nakamura. Everybody doesn't have, you know, 24 hours just to devote 
to chess, you know, but we had the same love and passion for it. And in the free time that we do get, we we try our best. And it's like every now and then we can, you know, play games, you know, games like this, you know, and uh, like I said, it's a it's a it's a lovely game. Just the consistency, the simplicity of white's attack, uh, black try just just with simple tactics and moves by white. Black was in uh, hot water very early in the game, and I think that's a lesson. You know that you can play just straightforward chess, classical chess. Like you don't always have to, um, you know, give give up material and things like that. But um, you know, like you can, you know, play because this move is a strange looking <laughs> looking move. And of course, black should equalize as I as I showed you. But the thing is, is white does have compensation. This this is a sound. I give my stamp of approval. This is a sound, uh, a sound attempt by Black. You know, I would love to see you know Grandmasters play this because um, I'm absolutely confident in this. In this position, again, as I said, that is Black's best. Is D takes, D takes, Bishop G7, Bishop C4, C6, Castle. And I dare black to take this pawn. Go ahead and take it. Because white is coming after you with full compensation. And to me, if that's the best black has, then you know, he might he might have to play something different. But um of course this is the star of the game right here. This knight takes F seven, which is absolutely beautiful. But anyway, I hope you guys like that video. Please subscribe. We're going to be looking at some, again, continuing our traps in Alicon defense and then before moving on. And I'm um, just putting up like different, you know, just chess related videos and stuff like that. And when I get a chance, I try to do deep analysis like in this game. And, um, you know, just stick around, subscribe, like all of that stuff, comment, you know, um, like if you you know you below 2300 you know you 2200 you know you in that state or if you like 1500 1400 this channel is uh channel is definitely you know for for you so um you know you you definitely get better like like I said um I try to explain the uh, motives behind the moves and uh, so that you get like a real understanding you know I don't I don't just come out there and be like oh Killing with the King's Gambit or something, you know, like, you know, you know, gimmick titles like that. Like, you're just going to win all of a sudden. It's, you know, it takes practice and, you know, studying tactics, end games, stuff like that. But, um, like I said, for most of us, like, chess is, like, an enjoyable uh, pastime. And, um, but anyway, that's enough talking for me. And, uh, hope you enjoyed this game. And, uh, I'll see you in the next video.